Hey everyone, I'm Ruben Lara, and I am super excited to introduce you to Clip Studio Paint. I'm a freelance artist working in the illustration, motion graphics, and animation fields. And Clip Studio Paint has been one of the most important tools in my tool set in all three disciplines. It's fast, inexpensive, and most importantly, super customizable. And I know that can be intimidating for a lot of people when you first open up the software, but that's my goal is to just demystify some of that complexity and also introduce you to some basic workflows and methods that I use all the time. Now, if you're absolutely brand new to Clip Studio Paint, the first thing I wanna highlight is the price. I'm gonna hop on over to the uh, Clip Studio Paint website here. Now, it's usually $50, but they're often running sales like they happen to be right now as I'm recording this, $25 half off, which is a steal. Even at $50 though, uh, it's completely worth it for all the features that Clip Studio Paint packs under the hood. Now, a lot of people wonder what the difference between uh, Paint Pro and Paint EX is. The bottom line is that they're exactly the same build, except that Paint EX unlocks an unlimited timeline for the animation workflow. Paint Pro uh, maxes out at 24 frames, so Paint EX opens up the full timeline. And Paint EX also has some other um, multi-page management features if you're building an entire comic book uh, within Clip Studio. But if you're just interested in illustration, um, some limited animation, or just building comic book pages, uh, you know, one off and saving the files out and maybe organizing them in another piece of software, um, Clip Studio Paint Pro has the complete set of tools and everything you need for a full, a full illustration workflow. One of the nice things about the licenses is that every license can be installed on up to two machines, so that's super helpful. And in my experience, um, files open seamlessly between Windows and Mac environments. Now, I wanna take a minute to talk about Clip Studio Paint um, for iOS on the iPad Pro. It's pretty incredible because it's a one-to-one -one build of the desktop version except on your iPad. And this is what makes Clip Studio Paint workflow so powerful for me. Now, at the time of this recording, it is subscription-based. So it is an additional cost and also a separate license than the desktop version build. Now, some have issues with subscription models and maybe Celsius will change that in the future. But you should know what you're missing if that's the only reason why you're not using Clip Studio on the iPad. As subscription models go, I find it to be completely reasonable at the time of this recording at least. If you pay for an entire year, as you can see here, uh, $25 for the year, that's just a little over $2 a month. Now, if you can afford that and you create art for a living, then by all means, get Clip Studio Paint on your iPad. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm gonna switch over to a live feed here. Now, since it released for iOS, I've sold my Wacom Cintiq Companion 2, which I was just using as a mobile solution. And I've been using my iPad exclusively for when I'm away from my office and I need to get some illustration or animation work done. Um, it has all the exact same features as the desktop version of Clip Studio Paint. Um, so I can you know, take these palettes, dock them on the side, you know, customize it just how I want. Um, and yeah, it works quickly. And this is a pretty uh, hefty document as well. I'm working at you know 3,000 by 2,000, which is what I'd be um, uh, working on on my desktop anyway. It's fully integrated with the iOS Files app as well. So for example, I'm going to open the Files app here off to the side, and uh, we'll go ahead and open our kind of like in-browser manager. And we'll just take uh, this file, for example, and drag it right over and that's currently updating to, uh, to Dropbox. Same thing happens the other way around. So um, let me drag this one. And there we've made a really easy transfer. The other cool thing is that when I'm in my office next to my Mac desktop, I can also use AirDrop and it's super fast. Even when compared with other fantastic apps like Procreate or Autodesk Sketchbook, I keep coming back to Clip Studio Paint on my iPad because it's powerful, it's familiar, um, I'm in it every day on my desktop, and that is what keeps me working quickly and efficiently. All right, so I'll be guiding you through all the basics, and after each feature, you'll see this prompt. So if you're following along in your copy of Clip Studio, you can try what I've just shown you. It will last three seconds, and that'll give you a chance to pause the video and give it a shot on your end. All right, let's get started. Okay, let's talk about basic workspace functionality. Clip Studio is super customizable, and again, that's a little intimidating at the beginning, but it's actually what you'll love most about it once you understand how it works under the hood. 
The first thing you should know is how to reset your workspace into the default configuration if you feel like you've messed something up. And that's found under the window menu, workspace, and reset to default. So for example, I'm just gonna kind of randomly, you know, drag this stuff around and move this here and open this up. Just kind of generally mess it up. Uh, and we can just go to window, workspace, and just hit reset to default. You may have to hit okay on your end and that will bring us back to where we started. Now you saw me move a bunch of palettes around, so let me show you how that works. Any one of these palettes can be shown or hidden using the window menu. So for example, this one up here is called the subtool palette, and I can go to window and just uncheck subtool and that will disappear, and then recheck it, and then it will appear in its last location. Palettes can float on their own or be docked into specific regions or as tabs, as you can see in the default setup. To make one float independently, just grab it from the name, the label area on the tab portion and just pull it right out onto the canvas. I'll do that with the subtool in the tool property palette. To redock it, grab the label again and just drag it over into the area that you want to dock it into. Now you'll notice that uh, multiple kind of red lines appear showing you where it's going to show up once you let go. So make sure that you understand the difference between all these sections. So for example, if I move it over between these two columns, it's gonna dock it as an additional column. Let me pull that out again, make it a little bit smaller. I can also dock it um, into a space and that'll turn it into a tab. So now I have two tabs here, pull that out again. I can also dock it above an existing space and now it will split that difference. And of course, bring it out as a floating palette again. So go ahead and try that, make some palettes floating dock others into new spaces, or dock them into existing spaces as new tabs, then reset your workspace. Next, let's talk about collapsing and expanding palettes. So every vertical or horizontal region can be either collapsed completely or collapsed to an icon. So for example, if I double click this little double arrow in this middle column, you can see that the entire column has been collapsed completely. This can save a lot of space for palettes you don't use often, but you still would like accessible. Now, if you, if you still want a hint as to what's in there, you might want to just collapse to an icon. So I'll open that again, and this time, instead of clicking the double arrow, I'll click the single arrow. And now each one of those uh, palettes have been reduced to an icon. Now, when I click on any of the icons, the entire column opens again and, re and reveals itself and stays open until I collapse it again. So. I'll reduce that to an icon and I can click on any of these and then we'll open that entire column. Now one hidden feature which I really like is that icon mode also has two modes of its own. So if you collapse a region, this time I'll collapse this whole right hand side to icon mode and then right click or control click if you're using your pen, um, you can see that you can set it as display palette as tab or display palette as pop up. So we'll click pop up. And now when I click one of the palettes like the layers palette, I can open that palette, I can make the, any needed changes, and then as soon as I go back to my canvas, it disappears. And this is similar to how a lot of tablets out behave, like Procreate, where palettes aren't persistent and uh, disappear when you click on the palette again. One last menu item I like to enable is Window Hide Title Bar. Now watch what happens. Pay attention to this little title bar area at the top of the screen when I hide it. Well, it goes away. And it may not seem like much is happening, but notice what happens when I expand and collapse uh, regions. So as I expand, uh, my canvas automatically responds, you know, edge to edge to the full width of the available space. That's different from when I show the title bar and it could be that, um, you know, basically this entire window is floating, which is helpful sometimes too when you want a lot multiple documents open. Um, and when you expand and collapse these palettes, then nothing happens with the document. So that's just a personal preference, but I like to remember the shortcut that is a shift tab. So I'm often just hitting shift tab and that expands to the full width of my available space. So go ahead and try those three things, expanding and collapsing regions, collapsing a region to icon mode, and then setting it to pop up versus tab mode, and also using shift tab to show and hide your title bar. Next. Let's talk about basic camera navigation. And we're talking about three main things, zooming, rotating, and panning. All right, so if you're on an iPad or a pen display with touch functionality, you've probably already realized that you can just use you know, your two fingers to pan, rotate, and zoom. So that's pretty straightforward. But if not, there's two main ways of navigating around your canvas, using on-screen controls, 
or using keyboard shortcuts. Now, the first of the on-screen controls is right here in the navigator palette. So you see that you have um, access to a zoom, a rotate, plus and minus buttons, you know, to zoom in there, arrows to kind of rotate around. This black button um, zooms it to 100%. Um, that's not the 100% of your canvas, but 100% um, in terms of pixels. And if you click this last one, it fits the canvas. And if you click this little kind of rotatey wheel, um, it resets that rotation. So that's one spot. The other spot is actually on the bottom of your document. Now mine is not showing up because I've set my view, uh, I've turned off my scroll bars. Now by default, which is likely what your, your setup looks like, is that scroll bars are on. I just turn them off because I feel like you know they take up space. I never use them, and I'm usually using my keyboard shortcuts to move around anyway. But you should know that at the bottom are the exact you know kind of a pared down version of the exact same controls as the Navigator palette. So we have zoom in out 100%, uh, rotate, zoom back out a little bit, um, rotate around, and then reset rotation. I'm going to turn mine off because I really don't use them. And um, anyway, I prefer the keyboard shortcuts to navigate around my canvas. So to pan, you basically just hold down the spacebar, and that temporarily turns your cursor into a hand, and that simply lets you move you know, the canvas around the screen. To zoom, you want to hold down the spacebar, but this time add the command button if you're on a Mac, or control if you're on Windows, and that now turns your cursor into a magnifying glass, and you can just drag left and right to zoom in and out. So we're panning, and I'm just adding the command or the control button, and I'm zooming panning and zooming. Rotating is also just as easy, but instead of holding down the command or control button on Windows, we're holding down shift. That turns into the rotation icon, and now I can just rotate around. So panning, zooming, and rotating. Rotating, zooming, and panning. I can reset my rotation by going into rotation mode and just double clicking, and that will reset it to uh, you know its vertical orientation. One thing to note about rotation is that it does rotate around the center of your display. So if you're trying to rotate like right in here, you know, it can get a little bit diff difficult to control. So I recommend just rotating, you know, somewhere around the outer third of your display and you can get some really nice, um, you know, granular control over that rotation. So I'm double clicking and uh, zooming out. One quick note for Mac users, the default shortcut for invoking Siri is also command spacebar. So I'm often, you know, zooming, but if I happen to hit command spacebar with the command button first, then uh, yeah, the irritating Siri shows up. So th the way to fix that is just go into your system preferences, go to Siri, and let's just turn that whole thing off. But if you like Siri, then you can just change that keyboard shortcut to something else. Um, I never use it, and now that will never show up. Whether I hit spacebar command or command spacebar, then uh, that works there. Actually, I take that back. Command spacebar is also spotlight search. So um, you can also remove the shortcut for spotlight, you know, if that's um, showing up as well. So it all kind of depends on how quickly you press those buttons, but uh, that's just an FYI for, for Mac users. It's also a good time to mention um, the keyboard shortcut for fit to screen, and that's command or control zero. So command zero, I'm constantly hitting it just fits your whole document to the full width of your available space. So go ahead and try that. Pan with a spacebar, zoom with spacebar command or spacebar control, and rotate with spacebar shift, and then reset your display with command zero. Okay, next, let's talk about four important palettes to control and manage our brushes. And those are the subtool palette, the tool property palette, the Subtool Detail Palette, which I'll bring up there, and it can also be accessed with this little wrench on the bottom of the Tool Property Palette, and the Quick Access Palette. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of pull these out onto the canvas and just so we can see what these relationships are. So there's our Subtool, there's our Tool Property Palette, and I'm just gonna collapse this like we learned how to do, and we'll do this. Okay, and also let's pull out our, our Quick Access uh, Panel. Now the quick access panel or my quick access panel is going to look quite different than yours on default and that's because I've added a bunch of custom brushes to this panel but I'll explain what this is in a second. All right, let's look at the relationship between all four of these palettes. A good way to think about it is to kind of rearrange these into how often we access these in, a, in our workflow. So I'm actually going to put this up here at first and 
move these over. And I'm just gonna give myself a new layer and also collapse this. All right, just clean this up a little bit. So if we're talking in terms of access, quick access panel, we're going to all the time. Sub tool panel, often. Tool property, sometimes. And sub tool detail, almost never. Let me focus on these right three palettes first. As I click through um, on these different brushes, you'll notice that each brush is really just a combination of all the settings in the subtool detail. So the subtool detail palette has kind of like the master collection of all the possible properties that any brush can have. The tool property palette only exposes some of the settings from the subtool detail, the settings that most aggressively impact the look of the brush. So for example, if I go here to real pencil and I click here on the brush size category, when I change the size in the tool property palette, you see that it also changes in the subtool detail and vice versa. This shows that these two are really the exact same setting, except the brush size has an eyeball in it and that's why it's exposed in the tool property palette. Now, other settings like specified by size on screen and at least one pixel aren't really important for the functioning of the real pencil. They're not even selected, but also they're not exposed in the tool property palette. If they were important, then all we had to do is click this um, eyeball icon and you see they would now show up as options inside the brush size. Now these show up as children of the brush size because these options are children of the brush size. But if I go to something like ink, one setting that I find that I am reaching for is the opacity slider. And by default, it's not enabled on the real pencil. So all I need to do is turn the eyeball on and now that setting is exposed in the tool property palette. So you can see that once you get to know your brushes and you know which are the most often used settings from the subtool detail, we'll just click that eyeball on and then it will show up in the tool property palette. A couple of buttons you should know about here in the subtool detail are reset all settings to default and also register all settings to initial settings. So if I've made a bunch of changes, you know, to, um, to this particular brush and, you know, we've even made some, some really big changes and just ignore what I'm doing right now. I'm just making big changes to this brush. And now this real pencil doesn't behave like it did at the beginning. We can just reset all settings to default. We'll hit okay. It'll reset that. And it'll even reset what was exposed in the tool property palette. So that's a good way to just kind of get your brush, you know, back to the way it was when you installed the Clip Studio. If you want to make a permanent change to one of the default brushes or even one of your own brushes and make that the new uh, kind of reset, then click register all settings to initial settings. Then whatever settings you've currently made will be the new default when you click reset all settings to default. Another uh, fun little option is this tiny little wrench, also a wrench on the top of the tool property palette. It's called lock subtool and do not save change. And what this does is uh, when it's enabled, it kind of allows that brush to behave more like Photoshop does where you know you can make sure that every time you go back to that brush, all the settings stay the same, regardless of anything you've done during the session of that brush. So for example, I'm gonna turn it off and real pencil right now, let's just say is at 12, okay? So I'm, I'm moving it around and maybe I've come in here and I've uh, permanently enabled opacity and I, you know, I brought this down to 55. And now I come here to the, um, you know, the greasel pen, right? And I've used that for a little while. And then I come back to real pencil, well, all of the settings have remained, all the settings that I last left it at have remained. This is the way I usually like to work because it just helps my brain remember, you know, kind of keep track of, of where I was. But if I click this on, it will, it will retain all the settings every time I go back to that brush. So I'll just bring this back up to 100. I'll drop this to 12, you know, where we were at, and then turn that on. So now I'm drawing, okay, and I've you know, making that change, I'm getting a bigger brush size, I go back to another brush, and then I come back to the real pencil, even though I had to reduce the opacity and increase the brush size, it still goes back, you know, to 12 and 100. So depending on the way you like to work, you can set some brushes, you know, to behave that way and others not super customizable. So this now brings us to one of my favorite parts of Clip Studio, which is the quick access panel. It literally is just a collection of favorites. It doesn't duplicate your tools. It just groups them into helpful collections depending on you know the process that you're working on now. Now I've gotten rid of the default one that comes with Clip Studio, and I've um, you know collected various tools that I use for painting, for sketching, you know for when I'm doing whiteboard animations or traditional 2D animation. Um, you can set these to display in lots of different ways. So for example, when I'm on sketching or painting, I like to see the name you know the brushes that I'm using. 
But when I'm on animation, um, the different functions have you know different enough icons where I can just say um, you know how to show, and I'll just tell this very small. And now I have like a you know a complete kind of animation tool set of functions that I you know access all the time. Setting up a quick access uh, set is really easy. I'll just right click right here in the empty area or else go to the menu and say create set. And we'll just call this, you know, sketching O2. And you literally just drag things into that set. And that's what's great about quick access is that the same brushes can be used in multiple sets. I'll go ahead and uh, show this again as a list small. And we can drag, you know, brushes, um, you can right click in here and even go into the menu system, you know, and add um, things like, for example, let's see, file, export, you know, JPEG, we'll drag that in there. We can um, set a specific color and just say, you know, add drawing color. So it's a really versatile panel of favorites that I find myself going to all the time. If you want to learn how to use the quick access panel in more depth, check out my, uh, my Clip Studio Paint setup. Uh, video on my YouTube channel. There's a link in the description and that kind of gives you a little sense of how I like to use it and, and some additional advanced features from the quick access panel. So what all of this allows us to do, understanding how to use these palettes, is to simplify our workspace and just focus on the basic palettes we need for illustration. So let's do that now. I'm going to go to uh, Window and just kind of reset this to default again. Close up our, our subtool detail. And uh, let's just start getting rid of a bunch of palettes. So I almost never use a navigator. I'll hide that. And there's a bunch of tabs in here. This uh, can be a little tedious because there's no quick way to get rid of all of them. Now we'll talk about the materials folders a little bit later, but for now I'm just gonna get rid of all of these as well. All right, I'm gonna move my quick access panel underneath my layers palette. And I'm also going to set how to show to a list small. All right, and last I'm gonna to go to workspace and I'm gonna register that workspace. Uh, we'll just call it default simplified or you know whatever you wanna call it, hit okay. And now that's going to show up in our list of custom workspaces. So go ahead and give that a shot. Uh, play around with your brushes, your tool property, and your subtool details. Make some changes, reset them to default, add some things to your quick access panel, and then go ahead and just simplify your workspace to get rid of a bunch of panels that uh, we don't need at the moment. All right, let's talk a little bit about how brushes work. And when we think about the attributes that describe the ultimate look of a brush, we might think of some basic things like size, opacity, and texture. Let's see where, where those are at. First, let's talk about size. And like anything in Clip Studio, um, there's on-screen controls and there's also keyboard shortcuts. So let's switch to a new file here. And the on-screen controls are pretty straightforward. We've already seen that in the tool property, we can drag the brush side slider uh, or enter it you know, numerically or with these little arrows and that changes the size of our brush. But we can also use the brush size palette and that has you know a bunch of predefined uh, sizes that we can just click on. This is helpful in a project where you, you know, you have specific you know, line widths, like an animation, cell animation, where all the line widths have to be very consistent. The brush size palette can be a, a real big help. In terms of the keyboard shortcuts, just like Photoshop, the bracket keys will increase or decrease your brush size as well. So the brackets are usually found right under the curly braces. So bracket, right bracket, right, makes it larger, left bracket makes it smaller. Although the keyboard shortcut I most often use is Option Command. And if you're on Windows, it's Control Alt. So if I hold down Option Command on my keyboard and I click and drag, then I can dynamically change the size of that brush. And this is how I'm mostly working, especially when I'm working very organically. I kind of just immediately want a big brush or when I'm painting, and I can quickly go down to a small brush kind of on the fly without going you know, and specifically moving to a palette. Now there's an even quicker way of doing that. Uh, oddly enough, and that's by mapping the option and command or control and, uh, and alt keys to uh, the front rocker button of my Wacom stylus. So 
I'm not holding the keyboard at all, and I'm just clicking the front of my Wacom stylus, click and dragging, and as I'm draw drawing, right, I'm like drawing, changing size, getting bigger, getting smaller. So that is, to me, the fastest way of changing brush size. How do we do that? Well, this is specific to Wacom uh, tablets, but I know you can do this on um, various brands of, of graphic you know, digitizers. So I'm gonna go into my system preferences, find the Wacom tablet, control panel, and you wanna make sure that you are not, have not only clicked on your device, but also the specific tool. So I'm using the uh, Wacom Art Pen with barrel rotation, but I also have a Pro Pen, so I wanna make sure I'm on the Art Pen. Then I wanted to add a program, and I've already added Clip Studio, Clip Studio Paint, but let's just go ahead and delete that. So we wanna add a program, a software, and it will show any software that's currently open, so you have to have that software open to lock it in. We'll click Clip Studio Paint. And then we wanna make sure we're on the pen and to the uh, drop down that's um, pointing to the front of our rocker button. And we wanna to go to keyboard modifier and then I'm clicking command and option. And if you're on Windows, you'll wanna click control and alt. So I'm hitting okay, close that. And now that front rocker button is as if I was pressing those two buttons on the keyboard. So why don't you go ahead and give that a shot? Go ahead and use on-screen controls, keyboard, and if you're using, Wac uh, if you're using a Wacom stylus, then uh, go ahead and map those and see what that feels like. Okay, before moving on to opacity, I just wanna call out something I, I love about Clip Studio. I wanna clear this layer, and when I hit the delete button, it will clear the layer without deleting the layer, which happens in Photoshop, and it drives me crazy. So I just hit delete, and it will clear that layer, but it still leaves me with, the, uh, with a nice empty layer. Another way to do it um, is by using this tiny little icon with the little, you know, clear pop. So I can just hit clear there, like if you're on an iPad and you have no keyboard, then just hit that and it will clear that layer. Okay, let's talk about opacity. Well, it's pretty straightforward that there's an opacity slider right here in the tool property palette. But before going there, let's point out uh, what these little boxes to the right of these, of these controls uh, mean. When you click on it, um, you get a little window called brush size dynamics. And this is where you can set how the brush is responding to your pressure sensitive pen. So for example, the real pencil has the brush size set to pen pressure, which means that when I'm you know, have, applying light pressure, it's thin, and as I apply harder pressure, it gets thick. So if, if I turn that off, now I have a brush that no matter what pressure I'm, I'm applying on it, it's always giving me the same thickness. The same thing can be applied to opacity. So by default, the real pencil does not have opacity set to pen pressure, and I think that's the way it works best. But if we wanted to add opacity pressure to real pencil, then we just click pen pressure. Now I'm at a consistent size, right? Because size is not set to uh, to pen pressure. But now if I, I paint lightly, it'll go light, and if I and if I go dark, it'll go dark. I can set both of them on. In this case, I find that the um, okay, I take it back. I was going to say that the opacity isn't super noticeable, but um, the way it's set now, I can't get a dark thin line. I can only get a dark thick line, and also can't get a light thick line, right? Because both of them are on. So I think that's why this is set to not have pen pressure. And now I can get an equally dark thin line um, as I am getting, you know, on the thicker lines. So if I want to reduce the maximum um, ceiling, right, for the opacity for that brush, then all I need to do is change this. And now it will never be, you know, over 49%. This is a slider that, um, is that kind of a hassle to get to. So what I like to do is make uh, Clip Studio, in this case, behave more like Photoshop, where I can hit any of the numbers on the top of my keyboard and that will immediately go to that opacity. So I'm gonna hit the number five and that goes to 50%, 660, you know, 0, 100, 110. So as I'm drawing, um, particularly if, you know, if my brush doesn't have opacity mapped, which many don't, like oil paints, doesn't make sense to have opacity, you know, with oil paint. But every once in a while, you do want to paint with a little bit of that, um, you know, transparency. I could just go ahead and hit the number three, and um, now it's maxed out at at, uh, at thirty percent. Now that's not set by default, so let's see where we can set that in Clip Studio Paint. We'll go up to Shortcut Settings, and we'll go here into the Options, Tool Property Palette, and then we'll go down to the Ink. And the way you set shortcuts in Clip Studio is you just click inside and add the shortcut. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, delete right all of these shortcuts because this is what yours likely looks like, right? Um, and then you could just double click once and then hit the number one, click once, two, 
three, or double click maybe, four, five, and so on. So just set set opacity zero uh, from 10% to 100 all the way from one to zero. Now it doesn't give you as granular a control as like Photoshop does. You know, you can hit 56 and it'll go to 56%. But those steps are so minimal in my opinion that I'm I'm rarely getting that granular. And if I needed that, I can just you know kind of dial that in with um, with the tool property palette. But I'm, I'm most often just kind of hitting the the 10 percent steps so go ahead and give that a shot set your shortcuts up to map your keyboard to opacity settings okay before moving on to texture i just want to highlight the uh, stabilization slider right here in the tool property palette i'm going to switch to a g pen which is a great digital version of the japanese g pen and in fact they've recently added the real g pen which has a little bit of that texture in it which is really nice but if you're looking for that just nice, clean, simple line, the G Pen is just a joy to draw with. And part of that is due to the stabilization that these uh, that the brush engine has. So when the stabilization is on zero, um, I mean, even when it's on zero, I find it to be pretty smooth. But if you're having a hard time, um, let's see, let's just take this and, and drop the opacity. You know, if you're having a hard time, you know, getting like a nice, clean line, you know, for example, here, you know. Um, increasing the stabilization is just going to um, give you a little bit of that lag, which is intentional, and that helps you just find that nice stable curve, you know, as you trace around this artwork. Um, it is a little more processor intensive, and again, the lag that you see is um, not only because it's processing more, but I think it's also by design. It kind of actually helps you, um, you know, see ahead visually uh, to get to get a little more of that that clean curve but um it can slow down some brushes when the stabilization is too high so i find that somewhere around um, you know five or six is is where mo most brushes work best okay let's talk about brush texture reset my rotation command zero to go full screen for this let's open up our subtool detail which we can find under window but we can also access it with the wrench as we saw before and i'll just zoom in here um, basic brush texture is coming mostly from two different places. First of all, the texture that's assigned to the brush tip. So for example, the G pen has no texture on it, right? And that's why it's, it's so smooth. If we move over to the real G pen, you can see that it's basically the same settings as the normal G pen, I would assume, um, except with the addition of this uh, small image alpha, which is giving it that look, right? The same thing with the rough pencil, etc. So that's one place that the texture may be pulling from. And the second one is under the texture tab under this parameter called texture. And it basically uh, behaves like a canvas texture that gets you know um, interweaved with the texture of the brush shape. So for example, in this case, the real pencil by default, right, looks like this. But if I trash that texture, um, you can see that now it's only using the texture that's coming from the brush tip shape. So again, I can reset this to its initial settings. We'll hit OK, and we'll get you know that canvas texture back. So there, there we go. Now I can change that um, simply by clicking on this, and this opens up our paper texture material panel. And um, Clip Studio ships with uh, a bunch of default ones. You can see these that are labeled Dob have come in because I've purchased uh, a brush pack from, from Dob Company. Um, you can also make your own. So for example, I've made one called uh, RL Canvas 03 Blur, right? I hit OK, and now it's using that as the, as the texture underneath. So you can see that um, you can really add a lot of character to your brushwork by you know, using a combination of these things. So go ahead and you know, play around with those settings. You can always reset, reset things to default. Um, so I'm gonna reset this again. And in the brush tip shape, you can also add multiple alphas on top of one another. So for example, we'll click a new and we'll just add this chalk bristles. And now it's alternating between the first and the second shapes. Now it doesn't quite behave uh, like Photoshop's dual texture where it's actually kind of like merging and blending both textures together. Um, Clip Studio is just kind of stamping one after the other and you can set a random rotation. So in that sense, at this point at least, uh, the dual textures aren't as dynamic as Photoshop's brushes, but I haven't really missed it so far between the phenomenal default brushes that come that ship with Clip Studio and um, you know stuff you can buy online, I've been incredibly happy with the kind of analog nature that Clip Studio brings in its brush engine. 
All right, so go ahead and give that a shot. Play around with the image textures, not only in the brush tip shape, but on the canvas. Remember, you can always register those brushes to their initial settings. You can also create your own brush textures. We do this by registering an image material and then just applying it to the brush tip shape. The easiest way to do that is to start with a new document. So we'll go to File, New, and let's just make this alpha, um, let's say 300 by 300 pixels. Make sure we're on pixels here. And one of the key things you wanna remember is that you wanna set up your document as grayscale. If you set it up as grayscale, the image texture that you register will be able to be converted to any color that you choose in your color wheel. If you register your image material in a color document, then that color will always be the color that that brush um, gets assigned to. And that can be helpful too, like if you wanna make you know, a pencil that's always red or always blue, we'll start in a color document, make it that color, and we'll register that material, and then uh, it'll always be that color. But for a more general brush, we're gonna use gray, we'll, set, we'll hit say okay, and you can always check what color space your document is in by going to edit canvas properties. And we can see that it's set to gray, but we can also change it to um, color if we wanted to right from here. So let's just go ahead and um, yeah, make some, uh, move over to my pen, G pens. We'll just make some basic shapes. Maybe I'll just, you know, make an R just so you can see that we really are doing something unique here. All right, uh, we'll go over to our lasso selection tool, or actually we'll just say um, select all or command A. And we'll go over here to edit, register material, and we wanna register an image. So we'll select image. And that brings us the uh, dialog box to set this as a new material. So we'll call this R shape or whatever you wanna call it. And one of the key settings, if you wanna use it for a brush, is to make sure that you click use for brush tip shape. And that will let Clip Studio know that when you click the button to apply it, it's gonna basically only give you the materials that you know, are available as brush tip shapes. The other thing we wanna do is just stay organized. So let's just go ahead and open up the all materials tab and go to image material and put it inside the brush folder. You don't have to do this, but it's nice just to keep things organized because I'm gonna show you the materials panel in a little bit and it can get pretty disorganized. So we'll hit okay. Oh, I can add a tag as well. So I'll just say, you know, Ruben custom. We'll hit okay. All right, let's come back to our, um, our test document here. And so what we wanna do is kind of start with a basic brush that almost has nothing on it and kind of go from there. I like to start with the G pen. So I'm gonna right click on the uh, G pen in the sub tool panel and let's duplicate it so we don't mess up the G pen. And this will be the, uh, you know, the Ruben brush. All right, we can change the tool, tool icon if we want. It, it doesn't really matter. That's just um, how you wanna see it. All right, so we'll make sure that we're on our new brush and we'll go to brush tip. And in this case, we want it to be a material. We'll click the new shape and we get all of our brushes. So we can either try to find it or we can search for it this way because we both tagged it and named it, uh, select it and hit okay. All right, let's see what that looks like. Okay, not much of a difference because we're just kind of seeing it you know, right there on the edge, but it is giving us you know, that little shape. In fact, if I just make it larger and I tap once, you can see that it is right just adding that alpha over and over. If we really wanted to see that shape a little more, we can come over to the stroke and maybe increase the gap a little bit, right? And now we're getting more of that shape. Um, we can turn it into a ribbon, right? So you can easily see how you might create like a zipper or something like that. And in fact, um, in Clip Studio's effect section, you'll see a lot of that happening where a lot of these effects are just kind of alphas repeated in various different ways. So go ahead and go into those effects brushes and just see what's possible um, and if there's a brush you like, you know, how it behaves, just go into the brush tip and just swap out the bubbles for, you know, your own alpha. In this case, I'll just add the ribbon thing again. The R thing, I should say. And now we're, you know, swapping between bubbles and, and our R alpha. So, and you can also go here and, um, for example, direction. There's no direction. We can make it random, right? So now this R is kind of, you know, let's randomize it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, random strength, and we'll just increase that. So now it should be randomly, 
Okay, so I was wondering why that uh, rotation wasn't working. But that's because this particular bubbles one is using the spring effect, um, which kind of overrides all the rotation. So if I turn this off, now we are indeed seeing that random rotation of our, uh, of our texture. So anyway, it's just a thing of getting into the settings and seeing how each brush works. I'm just gonna go ahead and reset this in case I ever wanna use bubbles again. Now that we've added a material, let's see where it landed. So we'll go here into the window, material, and let's just go to all materials. So again, um, because I'm on all materials, my latest shape showed up there. And this is a good time to just talk about the uh, material window. It's basically like a giant bin to collect things that you use all the time, whether it's brushes or canvas textures, or even just images, um, so that you're not searching and hunting through your file system. They're just always available to you no matter what file is open. So for example, you know, I started a, a folder called Perspective Grids and um, uh, added this image here literally by dragging it in. So let's do that real quick. Moving over to a uh, browser. Perspective Grids. And um, yeah, let's just get a random one here. We will copy it, copy image, come back to Clip Studio, paste it. And I'm gonna use another amazing feature here, which is convert brightness to transparency because once I paste it, I can't really see through it. Um, oops, I accidentally docked that there. So we're gonna say edit, convert brightness to opacity. And that is a wonderful feature. So now that I have a transparent image off the web, I'll just la label this, you know, grid two. I'll go into my perspective grids folder and just drag it in and we're done. So the next time I want a perspective grid and I open a new file, right, no matter where I am, I can always go back to my materials uh, panel and just bring that perspective grid in and, and just start using it. So, um, but yeah, that was just a little side note and I wanted to mention to you like where those brush shapes, you know, and any images that you end up registering or dragging in, they kind of all land in this, um, in the materials panel. All right, we got a little sidetrack there. But if you want, now's a good time to go ahead and try to create and register your own brush tip shape. All right, the last two things I wanna talk about in connection with the brushes are the ability to paint with transparency and also fast temporary tool switching. Now, painting with transparency is one of the most powerful parts of Clip Studio Paint's uh, brush engines. And here's what it looks like. I'm grabbing any tool, making some marks. And simply by clicking this transparency icon, either in the color wheel or at the bottom of the toolbar, we can immediately turn any tool basically into an eraser. Now, of course, we still have access to our classic, you know, hard and, and soft erasers, like any digital paint program. But the ability to turn your current brush into an eraser allows you to start eating out of your strokes and also benefit from all the goodness of the texture of your current brush. And to me, that just adds one more layer of, you know, kind of organic analog marks, right, to whatever you're doing. This is especially helpful, um, and I think even more apparent when you're using something like the brushes, right? So here I am on the oil paint uh, flat brush, and simply by hitting the transparency icon or using the shortcut, which is the letter C, which flips us between painting with transparency and painting with opacity, we can just start eating right out of that. Now the um, erasure will erase at the same opacity as what your current brush is set to. So for example, I'm gonna hit the number nine and I'm painting at 90% opacity. If I hit C, I'm also erasing at 90% opacity. When I'm on transparency mode, I can hit the number three and now I'm erasing at 30%. If I hit C again, I'm now painting at that same 30%. So it's just something to be aware of. But check out what happens, for example, when I use um, you know, a brush that has a lot more texture. For example, this uh, rag brush that's available in, in one of my brush sets on Gumroad. I can start painting with this rag brush and then hit the letter C and then immediately just start eating out of it with all of that same you know, texture complexity and goodness that we're getting from the brush stroke. That's much different than heading over to a soft eraser, you know, even at a large stage, kind of erasing out and then um, you know, trying to paint in and erase out and, and paint in. Being able to erase with that exact same texture Again, adds complexity and a, and a lot more traditional feel to our digital brushstrokes.
So give that a shot. Grab any brush and experiment with the letter C, painting with transparency and painting with opacity. So the last thing I want to talk about in this section is temporary tool switching. And this is really helpful uh, to just keep your momentum while you're drawing and painting so you're not you know, having to constantly go back to your subtool panel or even your quick access panel um, you know, just to temporarily switch to a, to a tool. So for example, here I have um, an oil painting and I'm going to go over to my oil paint section and I'll just use the oil paint flat brush. So in this case, um, you know, let's just make some marks here and I'm going to just sample maybe some of these colors here. By the way, hitting Option or Alt um, enables your color picker. So we can be painting and right, color picking and painting and color picking. So that's one way of blending. However, I also want to have access, for example, to my Blender tool. So if I go over to the Blender section, which the shortcut for that is J in Clip Studio, I want to quickly switch over to my uh, Soothing Watercolor, right? Blend these out, or maybe use my Dob uh, Bristle Bloom, Bristle Broom, which I really like as well. And then I'm going to go ahead and hit B again, right, to go back to my oil paint flat brush. But then I need to blend again, so I'm constantly going back and forth. Well, I could just hit the letter J, right, come here to the blender, then hit the letter B, and come here to the blender again. I could take that one step further by pressing and holding the letter J, the letter J, and not completely switching over, but temporarily switching over. So I'm on my brush, and I'm pressing and holding J without letting go and now I'm blending, and then as soon as I let go, notice what happens here in the subtool panel, it immediately goes back to the last tool that I was working on. So once you kind of get into the muscle memory of this kind of a workflow, you'll find that you're really quickly, you know, just moving through and, um, and almost like not even thinking about it. So I'm not looking at my reference here, but imagine I had some, you know, little highlights here, and I'm just holding J, blending that down, you know, painting, and even when I'm on J, I can still switch, you know, the size of my brush. Painting. You know, the oil paint flat brush that comes stuck with Clip Studio is, I mean, I've downloaded a lot of, a lot of different um, painting brushes from different sources, and I've even created my own. But nothing really beats um, how mixy and, and kind of just delicious that oil paint flat brush is. So, yeah. So there I'm blending. This also applies, for example, to, um, you know, if I have to, head over to an eraser tool or an airbrush tool. So how does Clip Studio know or how can you assign those shortcuts um, to the you know to the tools that you want? So for example, I have one of my own um, personal brushes that I really love, which you can also download on, on my Gumroad store. It's called the Sculpt Brush. And this particular version of the Sculpt Brush comes in two flavors, um, a regular kind of a sculpty, blendy brush, but also it comes with um, a texture underneath. So as I'm blending out, I'm also kind of adding you know, some canvas texture to that. Now currently my sculpt brush is inside of my, you know, my subtool brush palette. So that means that right now if I hit the letter B, right, there's no way to really change between my oil paint flat brush and my sculpt brush because it's all under the brush palette. If I hit P for pencil and I go back to B, it's just kind of going to that basic um, you know, category. But let's say I wanted to add another letter just to that one brush. Well, I can do that. Let's go over to our shortcut settings. Okay, and um, what we want to do is go over to our tools, and this is where all the shortcuts for our tools show up. Now, you may notice on, on your setup that several categories are set up to the same letter, so that if you hit that letter over and over, it's actually switching between different categories. So, for example, right now I have my brush set to B, right, and nothing in, else inside my brush is are set to B, but I can also set it to the decoration tool and assign it to the same letter, right? So B is to brush and B is to decoration. If I hit OK, if I click B again, right, it'll just switch between the two things that I have it assigned to. So if you find that there are some tools that you kind of just want to cycle through with the same letter, you can definitely do that. As long as you're aware of, you know, why when you hit a letter and it doesn't quite go to the category that you thought it was going to, it could be that that letter is assigned to a couple different things. So let's get rid of B off of our decoration and go into our brush and find my RL Sculpt Brush uh, text, texture. So I'm going to just double click in there and I'll just assign this um, H. So it's telling me H is already in use by hand, which I never use H for hand because I'm using my space bar. So I'm okay with that and I'll just hit OK. So now when I hit B, I'm going to my entire 
subtool brush category, which is how I've set it. But when I hit the letter H, I'm temporarily up. Oh, I didn't remove that, the set to hand. So let's go over here to the um, let's see tool, and that is going to be under, what is this under? Move. So I gotta delete that. Okay. So now I'm on brush, and then when I hit H, it's temporarily moving to my sculpt brush. So if this is one of my main blenders, right? I can make it behave the same way as you know Clip Studio's um, default blenders. So I'm I'm brushing, and then I'm hitting H right to blend, and then I'm brushing some more, and then I'm blending out. So temporary tool switching, super powerful and handy, um, you know, workflow just to get into the habit of, and it's also a great opportunity to just kind of highlight how great Clip Studio's uh, mixing brushes are. Um, so when you kind of get used to how they mix, what those properties are, definitely uh, work on that ability right away. Find out where those keyboard shortcuts are and you'll you'll see that you're gonna be working a lot more quickly. So go ahead and give that a shot. Maybe set a couple of brushes to unique letters, remove some letters from brushes that are cycling through and just understand how that works. Okay, let's talk a little bit about selecting and transforming. It's pretty straightforward, but I think it's worth going over. Let's go down to our fifth category there, which is the selection subcategory. And we have you know, the straightforward rectangle, ellipse, lasso, polygon, etc. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and use the lasso tool and um, you know, selecting is as straightforward as you might imagine. Make a selection, hit shift you know, to add to that selection and option or alt will remove from that selection just like you, know, you might be used to in Photoshop. One thing that you uh, may notice is we have the addition of this little selection launcher at the bottom um, of your selection whenever you, whenever you make it. Now at the beginning, this used to really annoy me all the time and I would just turn it off. So you can sit, go to view and just uncheck select, selection launcher and uh, you know now you have a more standard selection. However, after working a lot on my iPad where you know I don't have access to all the keyboard shortcuts and I'm mostly just working with on-screen controls, the selection launcher has been a real lifesaver, and now I, I find that I'm also using it on the desktop because it's customizable, but even in its uh, default state, has a lot of useful features. For example, immediately here we have a deselect, crop, invert selected area, show border of selected area. This is like hitting Command H on Photoshop where we kind of hide the selection. Uh, what else is in here? Expand selected area where we can you know expand by three or pixels or whatever. The next one is shrink, which behaves much the same. Um, a clear, this button does the exact same thing as the clear up here, right? So it'll just delete that section of, you know, whatever layer we were on. This one is um, clear outside selection. So you make a selection, deletes the outside. These two I really love. This one is called cut and paste and copy and paste. So it's pretty straightforward. So oftentimes, you know, I'm working on a piece and I just, I realize I need to just separate something out. So for example, here on the dinosaur head, if I decided that I just needed to you know, kind of play around with where that one is, I could hit Command X or Control X and then Control V, right, which pastes it onto a new layer. And now I have access to that as a separate layer. So if you're already used to doing that, that's all fine. But again, we're talking about um, you know, shortcuts and workflows that really just help you speed up through your work. So this one um, does what it says it does. It just click it, sorry, just click it once and it, it cuts it and pastes it onto a separate layer. I'm using that one all the time. And the second one copies it and pastes it onto a new layer. So you'll see that actually copied just the head and then you know just placed it right on top. So cut and paste and copy and paste, something I use, I use all the time now. Let's see, where are some of the other ones there? Transform, um, it's the same thing as hitting Command T, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, this one here is flip horizontal, right? Um, I don't know why it's an arrow like that. And the other one is fill. You can set whatever you want in here. So for example, oftentimes um, I want to make a quick adjustment layer, especially when I'm, my, when I'm on my iPad. And um, I don't know, let's just take uh, another example here. So let's just say that I have a selection, you know, like right here. And I just wanna make a quick, um, uh, tonal adjustment. Well, I could come up here to edit, go to tonal correction, right? Tone curve, and you know, make that quick adjustment and hit OK, and then I'm 
I'm good to go. Or I can just add that tunnel correction right here to the bottom of my selection launcher. So I'm going to click this button, which is the selection launcher settings, and we'll find that same command except now in this menu. So that was under edit, tonal correction, and tone curve. So I'll just go and just drag it right over, just like a quick access panel setting, right? I could do tone curve. I'll just put my levels in there, color balance, and hue saturation. These are kind of ones I use all the time. Now I put separators in there for me, so I'm just gonna hit um, a command on Mac or control on Windows, and I wanna kinda of just put them all in the same section without dividers, right? I can also um, grab a divider and delete it if I want, but the divider is kind of nice to you know, kind of keep things organized. All right, so now when I make a selection, right? Any selection, I have those immediately at my fingertips. I can just go and hit that curves and just hit okay and then I'm, and I'm moving forward. Again, a lot of this stuff you can do in the menu system, but being able to identify where these little workflow and enha enhancements can speed you up just keeps you out of the interface and actually painting and, and drawing in that space that you're currently at. Another powerful feature of Clip Studio is its transform functionality. I'm gonna move back to our baby dinosaur here. At its default functionality, you know, Command T behaves just as you would expect. So I'm gonna hit Command T. I can, you know, rotate that section, right? Make it bigger, make it smaller. If I hold down the Command or Control button, and I start grabbing one of these sides, it turns into a skew, or one of the corners, right, turns into a distort, just like, um, you know, mo most normal transformation uh, functions do. I can also come here into Edit, Transform, Mesh Transformation, and we get a, you know, kind of your classic little mesh transformation grid. We can come here to the tool property of when mesh transformation is active and increase the number of, of uh, grid lines, you know, for more granular control and you know, go ahead and, and it does what you would expect it to do. But that's not the most powerful part of Clip Studio's transform. To me, it's the fact that it will transform multiple layers at once. And this is awesome because who's really always drawing just on one layer? I know I'm not. So in this case, you know, I started with a girl, I separated off her arms, I was playing around with her, her face, then even the dinosaur arms I have separate, and I, I'm not ready to commit yet. But if there's some kind of like, you know global changes I want to make overall, I want to be able to apply those across the board. So I'll just grab a rectangle here and select anything that I want it to affect, and even something like the mesh transformation. If I move in here and you know make some of these changes, you can see that it's applying them to all the layers at once, and that is really just amazing because now I'm I'm able to benefit from all the work across all the layers. Right, and, and make those transformations. It will also apply to adjustment layers and masks and alphas and anything you have in between. The other nice thing is if these happen to be inside of a folder group, so I'll click here in the menu and, and say um, create folder and insert layer, right, which is like Command G in Photoshop. And in fact, I've set that shortcut, select all those, and say Command G. Um, if I am just at the folder level, right, and I hit Command T or even do a mesh transformation, uh, it's going to affect anything inside that folder um, together as a unit. So super powerful transformation tools. There's another really powerful and fun version of the lasso tool that I think now is a good time to mention. And that is the lasso fill tool. Now I've moved it into my selection subtools, but if it's not in uh, yours there, I believe it's usually under the, I can't remember where it is by default, but it's in a really random place. So go ahead and just check through these categories and you'll see the lasso fill tool. I think it's under direct draw, I can't remember. But since it looks like a lasso and behaves like a lasso, I put it in my selection toolbar. I also dragged it up into my uh, command bar because I just I use it all the time. And essentially what that does is, let me just create a new layer here. Um, it not only lets you lasso something, but as soon as you let it go, it just fills it and then deselects. That's what I'm constantly doing, or I was constantly doing that in Photoshop, making a selection, Command delete to fill, deselecting, you know, making this over and over and over again. So this tool just absolutely makes total sense, especially when you're blocking out, you know, big shapes for, for colorization purposes. So if I just kind of, you know, reduce that completely and I want to go in here and, um, you know, quickly block out this uh, big silhouette, the lasso fill tool is a great way uh, to just do that very quickly.
also want to point out that you can also use lasso fill in conjunction with paint with transparency. So again, just like in a, in, when we were using our brushes, if I hit the letter C and I go into paint with transparency mode, I can eat out of that selection as well. So I'm just having my finger on the letter C. I'm lasso filling. Of course, I'm pretty good at lasso filling, so I don't have to delete so much. Right? But if I needed to, like right here, right? Just eat that out. And you know, we're good to go. So lasso fill tool is a huge time saver. Okay, next let's talk about saving selections. Now if you're coming from Photoshop, you may be used to saving your selections as additional channels in the channels palette. And uh, there is no channels palette here in Clip Studio. But there's another um, equally intuitive way to save selections and that is saving things as a selection layer. So for example, um, for those of you wondering why you may want to save a selection, is let's say I want to save the silhouette right of this of these two figures for later use. So I might create a selection from this layer, which basically loads, you know, all of the paint marks I made, and I want to save that for later because it's possible that maybe you know in the future I have created another layer like this, and I've you know taken these two and I've merged you know merged these two layers, and all of a sudden I've lost my ability to only paint you know within those boundaries. So by saving a selection for later. I can guarantee that I'll always have access to that. So I'm going to hit Command or Control Click as I click on this layer. I'm going to load that selection, and then I'm going to come up here to Selection Area and just say Convert to Selection Layer. Well, that gives me a new layer that is just a selection layer. That happens to also be green, like my background. Let me just change this to uh, to another color. I'm hitting Alt uh, Option Delete or Alt Delete if you're on Windows to just fill right with the currently selected area. It's a quick way to fill. I could also have used, you know, the fill bucket. I uh, change this and fill to another layer, to another color. Anyway, um, what what we have now is a selection layer, so that no, no matter what happens, right, to these two layers, and even if they go away, um, I can just double click that little green area, and my selection, you know, immediately loads. So it's it's pretty straightforward, uh, but it's just it's you know worth worth noting it. Oops, I was in the wrong layer there. I'm gonna fill that. Um, one of the nice things about the selection layer is just like you can, you know, just like the alpha channels in Photoshop, is you can get in there and add additional um, kind of marks to them with your normal brush tools. So um, if I duplicate this layer, again I hit Command J because I set that as a as a shortcut, but you can also come up here to duplicate layer, and I'm on the selection layer and I show it, right? I can come in here with one of my brushes and. You know, add to that. Let me just delete this for now. I'm gonna go up to 100%. Right? It also respects transparency. I'm hitting C to paint out. Right? I'm I'm hitting J for my blender brush. Okay. So it's not just hard hard edges. Right? That becomes my new selection. So that if I'm on this layer, and again I grab one of my brushes, and I'm only painting right within within that transparency of those selected pixels. Okay, so give that a shot. Uh, play around with your selection tools. Go uh, find your lasso fill tool, see how that works. Save some selections, make selections, transform uh, using not only the regular control T transform handles, but while you're in that mode, uh, make sure you try pressing command or control to skew, to distort, get in there into that mesh transformation. Uh, and then make sure you experiment with transforming multiple layers at once, whether it's by selecting multiple layers or by putting them into a folder group, selecting that folder, making a selection, and transforming multiple things at once. So super powerful uh, selection and selection saving tools. All right, we're almost there. I just need to show you a few helpful things about the layers palette that not only helps you keep your documents organized, but are real time savers as well. Okay, so here we are in our layers palette, and I think the basic functionality of layers is pretty clear, right? You can turn things on and off. You move layers uh, around by making selections. Now, if you're on an iPad, you can also take advantage of this little selection column where when you're using a keyboard, you can just shift select, right? But if you're on an iPad, go ahead and just click that little check mark, and that's as if you were shift selecting something 
and then you can do things like you know put those things into a folder or merge them and things like that so that's this little check mark column I'm just gonna skip around to a few of these tools some of them um, you know are for more advanced workflows but there's a few that you really need to understand um, just for basic layer palette functionality the first one I want to highlight is lock transparent pixel it's like Photoshop's preserve, preserve transparency. And all that means is that when this is enabled, um, then when you start making marks on a layer, it's only gonna make a mark where there was an existing pixel at any transparency. So I'm just gonna turn off our, our sketch layers right now. And because you know lock transparent pixels are enabled there, when I try to paint on this layer, it's only gonna paint, of course, I didn't lock transparent pixels on that one. There we go. It's only gonna paint inside you know areas that I've already painted on if I uncheck that and keep painting then it paints as normal and then when I check it again then it's going to respect you know those new boundaries so that's lock transparent pixel that's helpful sometimes when you want to kind of just flood fill an area again so let's say let's say I just want to reset that I'm going to hit uh, option or alt pick that color and hit option delete or alt delete and I'll just do a flood fill on that whole layer and because lock transparent pixel is on, it's only uh, filling where I previously had made marks. The next one is this one, which is called clip at layer below. This is very similar to lock transparent pixel, but it behaves on another layer. So for example, I'm gonna make a new layer here and I'll just make some paint marks, right? But as soon as I lock, as soon as I clip this at the layer below, the behavior is similar, except I'm able to keep my marks on a separate layer. Right? And there's some obvious, you know, obvious advantages to that. So um, uh, let's just turn on our, our um, sketch there. So let's say we wanted to have a layer just for her hair, right? So we can do this. And because I'm clipped that layer below, then I'll just, you know, I'm just doing a quick paint job here. And maybe we'll make another one, right, for our dinosaur. And we'll clip that one also. And let's say he's gonna be, you know, green or whatever, right? And then we make another one, we'll just call this uh, dino and hair. And you get the idea. You can kind of keep stacking as many layers as you want and just clip them to the layer below. And not only, um, you know, kind of retain that silhouette, but also be able to um, further manipulate those uniquely. So this hair, I can now itself lock transparent pic uh, pixels and, you know, change some colors in that hair. And not on only am I you know, just clipping to that layer, but I'm also still within the boundaries of, you know, the parent layer that I'm clipped to. So that's that's a layer clipping. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, this one right here, which is create layer mask. And even if you're already familiar with layer masks, but not familiar with how Clip Studio does it, you might want to um, pay attention to this. So layer masking um, is just what it sounds like. I can add a layer mask to any layer and I'm just gonna turn off my um, my sketch for now. And as soon as I start painting um, inside the layer mask, it's either gonna hide or reveal something. So I'm just gonna paint right in here and you may notice that nothing is happening. And that's because right now it's set to reveal everything because everything is painted white. Now if you're coming from Photoshop, you may be a little bit confused by this at the beginning because in Photoshop, a layer mask kind of exists in a grayscale space where black uh, you know, erases and white reveals. But Clip Studio works not with black and white, but with uh, opacity and transparency, just like our paint brushes, right? So as long as I'm painting with opacity, I'm actually revealing things. Just because I go to black doesn't mean that I'm hiding something. I'm still painting with opaque black. I actually need to go to paint with transparency. And now I'm starting to eat out of that alpha channel, of that, uh, of that mask. I keep saying alpha channel, just like Photoshop. Um, so I'm masking out and now I'm painting with right, opacity and I'm bringing that back in. And that works with you know varying degrees of opacity as well. So I've just set my brush to 40% and now I'm painting with 40%, bringing that mask back in. Um, and now I'm painting with you know 40% transparency. The other thing to note is the, the mask doesn't care what color you're on. Again, it only cares what your opacity setting for that brush is. So I could actually be painting with a bright yellow, but if I'm at 100%, then I'm you know, revealing at 100% as well. So just something to note. Also, if you um, option click or alt click, you'll kind of get um, you know, some kind of representation of, of what that mask looks like. 
So let's just go ahead and um, you know erase out of this mask. And if I alt click, it kind of gives me representation of, of what that mask looks like, similar to what happens in Photoshop as well. All right, so that's the use of masks. You can apply the mask, um, and as soon as you do that, it, it actually you know cuts into the layers below and, and essentially removes that information. Um, you can unlink the mask right from the original marks and you know move it around versus keeping it linked and now that whole layer is moving together and of course you can just delete the mask in the layer you know reverts to its original state before you added the mask so that's a little bit about the uh, layer masks we've already been making a lot of new raster layers and maybe i'm just going to briefly touch on what a new vector layer is now this could be the subject of a whole other video and we'll get into that later but i think it's worth understanding um, what vector layers do to Eclipse Studio Paint workflow, even in this basics video. To show that, uh, I'm just going to go over to um, a sketch I made on, um, you know, real paper and pencil on a pad. Um, and maybe this is something I want to ink in, right, digitally. So before I convert brightness to, to transparency, I kind of want to increase the contrast of the image so that all my white areas are completely white, um, and that's going to give me a fully transparent background. The best way to do that is using levels, right? So we've already talked a little bit about the tonal corrections that we can do both in Photoshop and in something like Clip Studio. And in this case, I'm gonna use the level correction. So I can apply it directly uh, to my image or I can apply it as a correction layer. Uh, and you may be already familiar with this. It's essentially the same um, algorithms we're applying to this image, except in this case, we're doing it non-destructively Whereas when we actually select the layer and use the tonal correction menu, we're applying it directly right on that image. So I'm gonna use a, a correction layer in this case. And again, this may be a little bit more advanced topic for another video, but you can see what these correction layers do at least at a high level. So uh, levels uh, show me all the information, right, that I have in my image. So what I wanna end up doing is kind of pulling and even if you don't understand exactly what's happening now, at least you can know how to kind of prep your sketches for, uh, for line art. Basically, if you pull you know, both of these sliders kind of in until you're happy with the result, until you don't see any more of that additional you know, um, noise, like that's kind of where you want to be. So I'm just going to pull this back, bring my, dark, you know, my blacks a little bit more. Down. Now remember, I'm just going to use this as a template anyway. So you may have to even take a better picture in order to have you know, less shadows and things on your image. But um, I think this will do for now. So I'm gonna hit okay. I'm gonna shift select both of these and I'll merge selected layers, right? Now, when I do a convert brightness to opacity, I should get a much cleaner result. So I'll add a new layer, new paper layer. And now we have a nice clean white against, um, against our, our backdrop. Okay, so that was just a little bit about how to bring in sketches. All right, so we're talking about vector layers. And the only difference between a normal layer and a vector layer is that it registers all the brushwork um, into a configurable vector line that you can move later on. All right, so let's see the difference between those. I'm gonna create a normal layer and I'm gonna go to my uh, pencil tool and you know make some marks. So let's go back to black because I was painting with transparency. Okay, and um, yeah, so that's that. Now, if I wanted to fix these little corners, I could just hit the letter C, right, and just start fixing these corners like that. And if I had some, you know, some details that I wanted to put in here, I would very carefully come in here or else, you know, maybe just do something like this and then hit the letter C or even use one of my erasers. Um, let me just get my hard eraser here. You know, and just really go to 100% and kind of carefully, clean, cleanly move those around. So that's basically your traditional layer. But watch what happens when I use a vector layer. The only thing that's changed is that there's a new icon on top of this layer that indicates it as a vector layer. I'm using any brush, so you don't have to use special brushes on vector layers. And um, uh, go back to black again. And you'll notice that um, the the quality of the stroke is is largely there, right? It basically looks like the raster layer, except, that when I go to my object tool, I can now go ahead and select those strokes and change them. So I can drag it out, right? I can adjust this curve, which clearly 
you're not able to do on something like a raster layer. Now it does create a lot of you know little points in here, um, but what's cool about the vector layers is you can adjust all the aspects of this brush stroke after the fact. So if I come here down to this last category, there's a lot of tools that apply to you know the nature of that stroke. So for example, I can uh, use the simplify vector line tool and just kind of paint over it, and nothing much changes about that line. But when I go back to object mode, you can see that there's a lot less points, and now it's a lot easier for me to go here, go through and um, you know make those adjustments, right? So if I come here and I just you know run that simplify vector line tool again, I can always go back to my object selection tool and you know move that around. This is a good time to understand that there's two kinds of selectors in Clip Studio 2. Again, some of this is a little more advanced, but it's good to know about it so that you're not confused by how to select things. So if I use my normal move layer selection tool, I can still move those elements around, but I won't be able to select these lines individually. I need to go into my object selector and that will let me now move these points around. So there's some nice advantages to using vector layers um, depending on what your final you know, result is. One of the most powerful features about vector layers is the fact that since they know about each other, these brush, you know, these strokes, um, they also know when they intersect each other. So um, in a case like this, right, where I have these, um, these intersecting lines, if I move over to my vector eraser, and this only works with the vector eraser, I'm just gonna get a you know, normal size brush, and I start erasing out, it will immediately detect you know, where the next vector line is. So I can literally just kind of scrub through these and get perfect edges, right, on all of these contours. Now this may not be the look that you want, right? But um, if you're doing a nice, clean, you know, clean ink job on this, um, maybe it's something that you, um, maybe it's a look that needs to be like, you know, really clean and, and accurate. So I'm just gonna, you know, do the same thing that I did before, right? And because my last eraser tool that I used was already set to vector, I'm only temporary tool switching. I'm holding down the letter E without letting go, and I'm just literally, you know, just erasing these lines like that very quickly. And let's say I have a lot of detail in here. I'm holding down E, just running my brush over those, like very loosely, it's automatically detecting where these vector lines intersect. Now to get, you know, an inking job that clean, it would take so much more work because you're in there noodling away at the corners. Um, yeah, so this is a case where vector lines would definitely, you know, be a real lifesaver. I can also, um, you know, you, use this often when I'm, even when I'm doing, uh, you know, more organic type inkings. So for example, one, one brush that I really like to use is um, this Greasel from Dove, and it kind of just looks like a, like a nice little Sharpie marker. Again, it doesn't matter what brush you're using. The brushes are independent of the vector layer. You can use any brush on a vector layer and will create you know, those strokes. So for example, um, let's see, where's a good example down here? Let's say I have this, um, you know, this shape like this and you know, I've done this. The, the important thing is that you have to make sure that these lines intersect, right? So I can basically do that. And even on this very organic looking brush, right, I'm still getting uh, some nice clean follow through right on these big curves and let's say I really wanted to sh you know kind of hatch mark hatch mark this in so let's just do that right go all the way through I'm not worried about kind of hitting that line just hitting my E done and done I missed that little one there right so a really clean way of um, of, of getting some line work in there when, when all those lines have to respect each other. And you can imagine that this is super helpful when you're doing you know, a lot of perspective uh, information. So I can really quickly um, you know, knock out something like this, even kind of at this high level, right? You know, where continuity between shapes is, you know, maybe a little more important or just, you know, tends toward clarity. Let's get my, my vector eraser nice and small. So I'm just hitting it right in there and done. 
So once you understand how it works and kind of get used to that workflow, super, super powerful. Um, and I also want to show you a couple of other interesting tools, again, just to expose you to them so you know they're there, um, that make a lot of sense when you're using uh, the vector layers. Again, all of these tools work on any of the layers. So for example, this curve tool, let's say I want to you know, just hit, I want to make all these curves right here on the top of the robot. So the way the curve tool works is you, you press and make a mark, and then you release it somewhere. And then when you release it, <clears throat> I'm not touching the canvas, I'm just hovering over the canvas. As you can see, it, 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 it's, it's trying to ask me where I want that curve. And the nice thing about this is I can kind of like, you know, really lean it um, exactly to where I want it. And then when, I, when it's where I want it, I just commit, and then that curve is made, right? So I'm dragging and then letting go and hitting that curve. Dragging, letting go, and hitting that curve. So let's see how that applies to uh, something like this robot. So I may be able to kind of like hit this whole line, right? Make this curve, come here to my object mode, select it, okay? And if I need, you know, more points right here, I'm going to add a point by uh, clicking, let's see, control. And I'm going back to my object mode. So you know, inking something like this may be um, a little more tedious. All right, so now I have a nice clean line. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is give myself uh, maybe some thick and thin, and because you know I'm working on a vector layer, I can do that with this. So I'm gonna correct the line, work, uh, line width, and I'm gonna make sure that I'm on thicken width. So I can set this to be super aggressive or not. Now watch what happens when I thicken it, right? It's like slowly starts to build up. So I can even, you know, I can create like thick to thin to thick. So let me just undo that a couple times and then I'm just gonna thicken it up here and thicken it up there. And now I have kind of like a, an interesting, you know, thin to thick. And it was really aggressive there. So I'm gonna switch to thin and maybe just reduce this so it's a little bit less aggressive. Just thin that out a little bit. And I'm already getting, you know, kind of a, an organic uh, line, right? It's just lots of control. And maybe you're good at making these curves and you have a you know, big Cintiq like I'm using now. But if you're on a little iPad or if you're on a, a, a tablet that's not a pen display, you know these these tools are really going to go a long way to helping you kind of just get these long, you know, smooth curves. Let's keep going a little more just so you can see the value of this vector layer. So I'm going to go to my um, my curve tool again, um, and I'm just going to hit this in two in two curves versus you know one and then adding points. So I'm just going to do like this and like that. Can hit that same zone. Pull out that curve, here we go. And um, yeah, the more you do this, the more you'll kind of get used to, you know, where these, um, where you want to kind of start and stop these points. I'll hit my object tool again, and maybe I just want to, you know, join that up a little more, something like that, select this one, join that one, all right? So those are four curves right there. If I wanted to connect them together, I could um, just by coming here and say connect vector line. And so, boom, connect those and connect those. So now they should behave as, as one giant curve. All right, don't have to do it, but could if you wanted to. Um, and because they're vector curves, again, I'm gonna come here and correct line width. Let's just um, select these two and behave just on those two. Actually, it's behaving on all of those at once. I think there's a way to just do it on one or the other. Maybe by putting it on a separate layer. Something like that. And then I'll grab my vector eraser and, you know, I mean, look at the corners that it's giving me. Super clean. So it's a pretty impressive system uh, to detect, you know, those vector layers underneath. Again, the final result is still raster. We're still, you know, drawing on a raster image but it's using vector information uh, to create that brushwork. So lots of powerful potential there and definitely something to at least know about and experiment with. The last thing I need to show you about this is one more awesome feature that um, a lot of artists and you know concept artists use all the time. And that's this little blue button in the corner. Now, if you don't see it on your end, um, this can happen when you're on a, on a smaller iPad, is you know it will tend to hide itself when the layers palette is uh, very narrow. 
So I'm just going to open this up um, so that I can make sure I can see it. And what it's called is change layer color. Now, when I'm on my iPad and I do have my, you know, my layers palette, you know, fairly narrow, I almost always have it included in my command bar. So switching using layer color is the same command as, as basically this one right here, change layer color. What is that? Well, let me come over here to uh, back to my dinosaur baby. And let's say I've, you know, I've kind of resolved most of my sketch in the way that I want. And now it's time to, you know, to do a second layer refining. Actually, let me take a step back. Let's say I want to still refine some of these things, but because I've done this in so many different layers, I'm, you know, I'm getting a little confused as to where things are at. So for example, uh, let's say I had some questions about, you know, how the dinosaur's arm was wrapping around her arm. Well, I could just grab the arm layer and immediately turn it into blue, right? So anything that I just want to temporarily switch into another color, I just use, uh, you know, convert to layer color. And it's, it's what animators and artists have been doing, you know, for decades where they'll use a blue pencil, you know, for their initial drawings and then kind of come over with another color and maybe do their final lines in black. I use this all the time to just um, either isolate that section, maybe I'm working on her arm and I want to see it more clearly, or I kind of just want to tone her arm back so I can understand what's happening with the dinosaur. You can also do it using layer opacity, but switching that whole layer color um, temporarily um, is just a real quick way to just keep you know making sure elements emerge together. It also behaves on a complete folder. So I can grab that folder, switch using layer color, and um, you know, maybe I'm doing a second version of this you know, now that I have you know, most of the information there. Um, you know, now, now I'm kind of just using it as a guide. But I don't have to go into each one of these, you know, lock transparent pixels, fill it with blue you know, a million times, and then maybe go back to black if I, you know, if I didn't want that anymore. I'm just switching the entire folder using layer color and that's uh, super super powerful so go ahead and uh, experiment with the layers palette we talked about um, locking transparent pixels clipping layers right underneath uh, we talked about how to use alpha uh, or how to, how to add a layer mask and making sure to knock out using transparency instead of uh, opaque color and we also talked about the difference between raster layers and vector layers and also how to turn a layer or a folder group into a uh, layer color. So give that a shot. And we have one more thing we need to learn and then we're gonna draw something. Okay, the last uh, setting that I think every beginner should set up uh, is flip canvas. And if you have not been flipping your canvas while you're drawing, it's really something that you should start doing because flipping your canvas uh, allows your brain to kind of get out of itself and start seeing mistakes that you clearly don't see what you're drawing because when you're drawing because you're drawing it. Um, and just by that very fact means your brain is not seeing it. But as soon as you flip the canvas, you really start to see that a lot more clearly. And that is found under here in the view menu and rotate, invert, flip horizontal. I'm mostly, I find I'm mostly flipping horizontal, but a lot of people like, like to flip vertically as well. Um, and I've set that to um, a shortcut on my keyboard. Here, here in Clip Studio, it shows up in, as an ampersand, but I've been setting it to, um, you know, to the tilde key, like right under the escape or, anyway, you can set it to wherever you want. It's easy for me to grab and it's a quick one for me to grab there too. So again, how do you set that? Is we go to our shortcut settings, we make sure we're on our main menu, come to view exactly in the same spot, right, where we would find it here, rotate, invert, flip horizontal, and I've, you know, set it to that key. I don't know why it's showing up as an ampersand, but um, yeah, but it works and there we go. So um, just as you know, proof, I, I find that I'm constantly doing this when I'm, when I'm making faces, right? So um, let's just you know, do a quick head shape here. Okay, to me, I'm, I'm drawing this and it, you know, it looks fairly symmetrical. As soon as I flip it, like I can immediately start seeing, you know, things that are bothering me about the symmetry of this. So I'm going to go ahead and here into my um, into my lasso. Oops, I'm on lasso fill. Command T. I'm just going to distort that a little bit. All right. Um, this is, you know, way too huge. Okay. And and as I'm drawing, I'm constantly flipping back and forth, back and forth, just to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm keeping that symmetry. 
and it's funny things I drew in this mode you know when I even when I come back I'm finding that I'm you know read readjusting it because I'm starting to see it you know through through fresh eyes so maybe an E for erase right good so anyway you get the idea be able to flip your canvas back and forth just kind of helps your brain you know uh, quickly just readdress it from another perspective literally all right, give that a shot. I highly recommend setting a, a shortcut to Campus Flip and then start using it in your workflow. If you're not doing it already, I promise you that immediately you'll see better results in, uh, in your early sketches. All right, that is it. To wrap up, uh, let's cool down and draw something and hopefully implement some of the stuff that we've learned here. So um, as always, when I just don't wanna think and I wanna draw, I draw a dinosaur. So I'm switching over to my sketching tab and I'm just going to call out right um, as I go along just so you get a sense of you know a basic sketching workflow all right so I'm gonna start with my real pencil and uh, make sure I'm on uh, yep make sure I'm on black and just kind of lay some lay some stuff in all right I think uh, it's gonna be something like this I really love um, Kind of falling in love with this real pencil. I still love my, you know, my classic Clip Studio rough pencil, but um, I like some of that sharpness, right? That it's that it's giving me. Thick to thin. those pelvis bones in there Um, yeah, I'm always amazed at how, you know, how much of a natural feel you can get with, uh, with Clip Studio's pencil brushes. In fact, I meant to show you earlier, here's a piece I did um, not too long ago um, that's kind of like this newsprint feel, you know? Uh, and in fact, the real-time version of this is going to be available on the downloadable uh, version of this Clip Studio Basics tutorial on my Gumroad channel. So it took me about 45 minutes, and I just kind of go through how I set this up in which pencils I used. I used the Real Pencil, Clip Studio's Rough Pencil, and then these two pencils from Daub, Natural Pencil and Super Dry Stroke, that I absolutely love. Um, and you can very quickly see how you can get that nice traditional kind of like figure drawing, you know, charcoal and newsprint feel. So if you wanna go check out, check that out, uh, make sure to check out my, my Gumroad store for that. The other thing I do wanna call out um, about what I'm using here is that I've mentioned it before. I'm using the Wacom Art Pen. And um, I, it took me a long time to, you know, to finally get it, and it's it's less than a hundred dollars. Um, so if, you know, if you're making money um, with your your artwork, I highly highly recommend it. I wish I would have gotten it many years ago. Make sure that it is the art pen and that it says rotation sensitivity. The uh, pens that most of the Wacom tablets come with are either the Pro Pen or the Grip Pen. So make sure it's the art pen. It comes with a, a slightly rounder barrel at the front. It also comes with some chisel tips, which I haven't really used um, that much. But um, my goodness, when it comes to you know uh, feeling that rotation, um, uh, it, it really makes a big difference. And I'm going to show you right now as I as I marker some of this stuff in too. So I don't know. Maybe just add a couple more. And why not? Let's um, let's add a saddle because that is something I would love to do. 
write a dinosaur. Get that tail whipping around. Okay, that's a good general idea for that. Get some teeth in there. All right, cool. Um, let me just show you some uh, two more markers that I that I really love using, and I think I have those. Yeah, right here in my sketching set as well. Dob light chisel and light chisel size. Um, already just out of the box, they're they're great, you know, marker brushes. But when combined with the art pen's rotation, um, yeah, this has been the first time where I I really feel like I can control. Um, you know, especially something like a marker and, and, you know, getting those nice little edges, you know, where I need them. So I'm just going to hit four and let's see how should we light this guy. Maybe we'll just kind of do a, an overall. I mean, that is a good looking, you know, classic Copic marker mark, in my opinion. Right, and these these have slightly different. Um, oh, in fact, I think I made this one. I made a duplicate called size where, um, where it was you know the pressure sensitivity was a little more was a little tighter. Um, but I'm just going to use the same one and go ahead and just. But with this with this barrel rotation, I'm going to move up to fifty cent uh, fifty percent. I can really get in here, and you know control exactly where those marks are. Again, I'm just flipping that, flipping that that barrel around. And I know where it is because the flat part is always against my um, against the rocker. And it's really been the first time where I feel like I can get, you know, some of these more traditional. Um, you know, marker shapes in a, in a digital package. Um, it also works in Photoshop, so you just need to enable, you know, rotation on, on any brushes that you're using. So yeah, this is this big, thick, right, thick brush, but I'm able to kind of just get these nice, thin marks in there. Awesome. Okay, and I can always hit the letter C, right? And, and I'm gonna hit go up to 100% on this. And if I need to, you know, eat out, or if I want to go with something like, um, you know, this greasel pencil, right? Which was kind of giving us that nice little marker feel, but maybe I want to use it like a, um, you know, like a traditional like whiteout, you know, for highlights. Yeah, Dob has some really nice uh, brushes that I, I recommend. Just get the big pack. You know, it's not that expensive. Again, I, I say that if you're you know if you're doing this for a living. Anyway, yeah, you get the idea. So um, I just wanted to show you uh, those amazing marker brushes from Dob. Also, a little shout out to the Wacom Art Pen. Get it. It, it will change the way you, uh, you make marks on your Cintiq. And there you go, a dinosaur to end up on. All right, to really wrap up, I just need to show you one more thing, and that is this little white button in the top left corner that says Open Clip Studio. Now you may be thinking, I'm in Clip Studio, but you're actually in Clip Studio Paint. Clip Studio uh, is a suite of tools. So let's open that up, and it kind of brings you to Clip Studio's you know, mini browser. Now, the only uh, software available in the English version of Clip Studio right now are Paint and Modeler, right? which is a, another program to help you set up 3D materials for Clip Studio Paint. And if I understand correctly, the Japanese version has a more extensive you know, suite of tools. That's why it's called Clip Studio. Um, but there's some uh, new things about the Clip Studio um, environment that I think they really upgraded this year, which are worth noting. 
first of all, uh, make sure you go ahead and make an account for yourself because they give you 100 gigabytes of online storage for backing up and you know transferring files you know between systems or on your iPad. I tend to use uh, other cloud storage services like Dropbox. I find it's a little easier and faster, especially with the integration uh, of Clip Studio with the uh, with iOS Files app. So I don't really use the cloud storage service uh, myself yet, but you can. I mean, you can see all the you know the files that we worked on today. Some other stuff I've been you know working on with um, with some students. Um, and then you can basically choose you know, what you wanna sync and set favorites and things like that. You can also add uh, keyword tags to your canvases and you know, it's just a, an online cloud service. The other thing you can do is manage your materials. So again, here's that materials window again. And it's kind of why I wanted to bring it up because this materials um, uh, manager is something that kind of is on top of uh, the other programs within Clip Studio. It just happens to be accessible within Clip Studio Paint. But whatever you do here, and this is a nice way of organizing as well, um, will be reflected into your version of you know, Clip Studio when you open it up. So you can come in here and create you know, new folders. Like I had made a perspective you know, grids folder, and here's the grid that we put in today and immediately showed up there. I have another space where I have a bunch of watercolor textures that I drag in and use as selection you know, masks sometimes and you know, to get that extra grit. Um, I have different workspaces which I've uploaded. So, um, and again, here's our, you know, the brush that we made today. So I just wanted to show you that relationship between the things that we set up in Clip Studio. And you'll notice that it's actually, you know, a separate um, icon, you know, when you launch it, uh, whether it's in your Mac sidebar or in your Windows, in your Windows toolbar. The other uh, thing that you should know is um, the Essentials tutorials. Um, so you can come here and Clip Studio has their own version of, uh, you know, different tutorials. There's lots to learn about Clip Studio. Clip Studio assets, you can find other people's brushes, um, you know, drawings, textures, and things like that. Now, if you head on over to my YouTube channel, you'll find one that's called a My Clip Studio Setup, where I kind of detail all the things I've done to my workspace to really just, you know, speed up my workflow shortcuts. In fact, I've set up all the shortcuts from Photoshop um, into Clip Studio so that when I'm switching between the two, I'm not having to remember different ones. So because I've been using Photoshop for so much longer, um, it's easier for me you know, to set, make Clip Studio behave uh, shortcut wise in the ways that Photoshop does. So I've done all that in that YouTube video. But if you come here to the asset store and you just you know, type in Ruben Lara, I've set that up as a workspace, right? So if you come in here and this is free, you can uh, re-download that workspace and that workspace will show up in your window workspace, right, is RL right. So if I come in here, it's gonna tell me, all right, we're gonna reset your shortcuts, your command bar, and your uh, your preferences and unit settings, um, and kind of bring it into this updated workspace, right? So the only thing that doesn't um, display is the uh, quick access um, shortcut. So that's something that you have to set on your own. And I'll just uh, set these as lists small again. But my workspace uh, will be set up for you just as you see it here. Now it could be that some of these panels are you know, come in larger or smaller, especially if you bring them bring them in on an iPad. You just might need to kind of reset these widths. But this works it, workspace is set up with all my most used tools right here on my right hand side. Since I'm right handed, this will come in with all of these command bar shortcuts up here as well. I explained all of that in the YouTube tutorial. But that's that's one of the nice things about um, you know the Clip Studio asset area is you know you can share and try out other people's workspaces. And lastly, this is a great space to back up your system. So if you come here into, um, yes, this is where it's at. If you click this cloud button, right, you can um, back up all your settings. They have some issues with how this text is wrapping. But if you say back up setting now, okay, so I have to actually close Clip Studio Paint in order to back up. But you can back up your settings and then you can restore it, right, to, to any, any point where you had backed it up. And, and this will restore everything, your custom brushes, your materials, um, you know, it's more than just the workspace download that I showed you there, um, but it will, it will save everything that you have, including your quick access settings as well, custom icons that you've set. So this is a, a new feature that I think is really powerful, super helpful. It's a lot of stuff to set up at the beginning and uh, you don't wanna lose it. All right, well, that is it. Uh, I know this was a, a little longer uh, lesson than usual, but I really wanted to just make sure that your environment was set up correctly and that you understood all the basic pieces of how to create 
part in Clip Studio Paint. Clip Studio is all about customizing and getting into a workflow that you know works for you. On top of that, the brush engine is phenomenal. It's a pleasure to use, and I just find that I'm constantly coming back to it because I'm having a good time when I'm drawing. There's lots more to learn. Uh, there's a powerful animation workflow. Um, you can record actions, import 3D models, convert 3D models to line art. There's perspective grids, symmetry grids, all kinds of you know guides to help you uh, create smoother lines and curves and you know speed lines. Uh, comic book panels that you know make sequential story, uh, creating sequential art just a breeze. So make sure to subscribe to my channel, keep getting updates on new features and helpful workflows. And make sure to check out my Gumroad store as well for the downloadable version of this lesson so you can you know, just have it on your own offline. But also um, I'm gonna put in uh, the real-time drawing of that Acrobat uh, newsprint figure drawing that I showed you earlier, as well as uh, an inking and coloring of the dinosaur baby. All right, well, have fun. Don't be intimidated, dive in. And remember that the more you draw, the quicker you will improve your artwork. All right, well, that's it for now. Best wishes on your art journey, and we'll see you on the next time.